Okay. So, like a good TV serial, I'm supposed to tell you what happened in the previous installment. Uh, so, well-known properties of light, like uh, going in a straight line, if the medium is uniform, and if you have a boundary between two uniform media, you have the well-known laws of reflection and refraction. And they all get unified by the Fermat principle, which used to be called the principle of least time, but maybe it's better to just call it the Fermat principle because uh, we saw situations in which uh, it's not the least time, it's just stationary time. So it could even be a maximum and we'll see more possibilities as we go along. Uh, it could be constant, which is an interesting case. Right? Uh, and one consequence of the Fermat principle, which uh, I should have mentioned, is the principle of reversibility of light rays. Because uh, when we calculate the total time taken to go from A to B, that would be the same as the time taken to go from B to A, uh, provided the speed of light is the same moving in a given direction and in the reverse direction. Um, there are interesting situations where that does not happen but we are not going to get into that right now. Okay. And uh, these are a couple of other things that we talked about. The idea of stationarity, if you want to check it by using Fermat's method, then you make some epsilon change in the path and you try to see whether the path the time uh, changes in higher order. And uh, the whole rail track problem was meant to illustrate that, uh, which many of you did and the problem of great circles on a sphere. Some of you are wondering why we gave you these problems. That's just to uh, bring in the concept of stationarity. And one thing which we saw in the case of a spherical mirror is that uh, if you go and sit at the center of curvature, every way it goes, bounces at normal incidence, it comes back to you. So in a sense, you have formed your own image. Okay? And this is a case where uh, the path is constant for all the rays. So of course it satisfies the condition of stationarity. It's not a maximum or a minimum. Uh, I only mentioned in passing that uh, if you want to do something more interesting, not imagining yourself, but uh, taking rays starting from A and having them focused at B, you want the total path from A to B via the mirror to be a constant with two straight lines. And that's almost the definition of an ellipse. Okay. And uh, Interestingly, the other conic sections, uh, parabola and hyperbola, also have nice imaging properties, which we have again put into the problems for uh, this part, this lecture. Okay, so this is really a brief recap of uh, what we've done so far. Okay. Now, uh, one problem which was there was this uh, hypothetical situation of a beach and uh, sea and a lifeguard who had to rescue someone. And uh, being an intelligent lifeguard, he wanted to do it in the minimum time. And we saw that's the same as the problem of uh, refraction. So uh, this lifeguard comes in here and uh, gets refracted and goes and rescues the person. And then one interesting case is with the lifeguard sitting right on the shore. Okay. So uh, we can still apply Snell's law, but the angle of incidence is 90 degrees. So sine of that is one. So the refractor angle is the critical angle. So if you're on the beach and you want to rescue this person, this is the best thing to do. Run along the beach because you run six times faster than you can swim and then swim at the critical angle. Don't go all the way here and don't start swimming before that. Now, we have an interesting case where the guard is decided to go for a bath and then he has the cry for help from the novice swimmer. Now it turns out there are actually three options, okay? Uh, one is swim directly. Uh, one is, uh, see, this is a ray at the critical angle. Okay. So, uh, this is a ray which, where the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. So, you will have a stationary path, uh, just the same as for an ordinary mirror. So, go here, get totally reflected, and come. And of course, that seems a bit silly compared to this, but it's still a stationary path. And then you have this path where you go into the shore at the critical angle, run along the shore and come back at the critical angle. Okay. Uh, did I hear a query? 
No. Hello. Oh, okay. Now I'll continue then. Huh? So you were asked to calculate this path in the problem, but let me tell you something interesting. You, you optics textbooks don't tell you about a path like this. Okay. And in fact, I learned about it only quite recently that uh, you have these three stationary paths, and this particular one, which uh, comes into the critical angle and then moves along the surface and comes back here, uh, is known. Uh, it's not very well known. Uh, in fact, you will find it in engineering books, which deal with the propagation of electromagnetic waves. Uh, I haven't seen it in too many optics books. It's there in acoustics. In fact, I first read about it in an acoustics book. It's known as the lateral wave. So here is something interesting which comes out of Fermat's principle, uh, which uh, many of you may not have heard about. Okay. And I think in the problems for lecture one, I have actually given a reference if someone wants to follow up on lateral waves. It's not one of the standard textbooks, but it's a textbook about antennas and mainly used by engineers. Okay. So this is a little bit of uh, Fermat's principle. Okay. Now we are ready to uh, go to an application of Fermat's principle uh, when the speed is not constant. And when you say not constant, it could happen in a couple of ways. Um, the speed could be different in different directions. And that's what happens in a crystal. We call that anisotropy. Or uh, we won't get into that, even though crystal optics is a fascinating subject. I could do a whole summer course on that, but we won't do it. Um, but you could also have a medium where at every point in all directions, the speed is the same, but uh, at different points, the speed is different. Inhomogeneous is the word used for that, right? We've already seen one inhomogeneous medium, which is uh, the case of refraction, but it's really two homogeneous media with a discontinuity between them, okay? And in each medium, you have uh, light traveling in a straight line. Crystals I've told you about. And the case I'm going to come to, uh, which actually occurs in real life, and many of you would have seen it, is that the refractive index depends on position. Okay. So if you look at uh, this figure on the left, this is something called the mirage. And one does see it on a hot road. And uh, there are all these stories of travelers in the desert who think they're going to get water, but as they come closer, it disappears. Okay. So this is... Uh, uh, really, uh, you're seeing two rays now, and we'll get back into multiple rays later. But right now, I would say that this ray seems to be traveling in the region of uniform refractive index, so it just travels in a straight line. But there's another ray which goes downwards, and then it gets nearer the road, and nearer the road, because the road is very hot, you have a temperature gradient. And uh, if you have air at a uniform pressure but different temperatures, uh, the density will be different, right? To keep the same pressure. If the density is different, the refractive index will be different. And in this case, the refractive index is actually less near the road, which means the speed of light is greater. So now you can see how, uh, at least qualitatively, uh, this kind of ray could occur. Because although this is the shortest geometric path, in terms of time, this might gain an advantage because uh, you are first going to a region where the speed is greater, traveling some distance at that speed and coming back. Okay, So that's a very uh, hand-waving explanation of this mirage phenomenon. But we clearly need a deeper understanding and we'll be spending quite a bit of time on that. And uh, so now we have to find the path of least time. So Fermat just told you to go ahead and find it. He didn't tell you how to do it. right? So we are going to try and do this in a situation where the refractive index varies uh, along one direction. So again, uh, just to liven it up, I have gone back to these people who live on the beach, except now their intentions are a little different. Uh, there are a whole army of people sitting here. Uh, there's no sea to worry about. But this part, they can only run slowly. And in this part, they can run faster, maybe because of the nature of the sand or something like that. And their job is to uh, find a treasure which is located here, and also find it in the least possible time. So uh, they can't, don't have anything simple like Snell's Law to help them. But the advantage is they have a huge amount of manpower. It's a whole army. So what are they going to do? So first, the general orders people to go in all directions. Okay. 
So, uh, and we are going to make an approximation, an approximation which gets better and better uh, as we make the time step smaller and smaller. So, we are going to say after one second, see where they are, after two seconds, see where they are. Okay. So, uh, in the first step, they all, uh, let's just use the value of the velocity here. Okay. So, they all end up on a, it's supposed to be a circle, no? though I have not drawn it very well. So, now you have a huge army of people standing here. But they still don't know where to go, right? So they do uh, the obvious thing. So at each point, they again send out people in all directions. Now, it actually be fairly silly to send them backwards. But uh, let's make it very general. So the people who are sent out from here occupy this circle. The people who are sent out from here occupy a bigger circle because the speed here is greater. Okay? And likewise, you should imagine such circles drawn from each and every one of these points. So if you look at the region occupied by all those circles, that is the region which is accessible after two seconds. Okay. Um, and clearly, the people who are going to reach the treasure first are the people at the boundary of this region. Obviously, anyone else, he has to overtake them, he has to first pass this. Okay. So we are going to call this boundary uh, a front. Okay. In fact, that's what it's called in military parlance, the front line, you know, where all the soldiers are there. But this time, the soldiers decide to do something more intelligent. Okay? Now, these circles are tangent to this uh, front. Therefore, this line is uh, at right angles. To this. And also, approximately, if you take a small step, it's true also that it's right angles at this point. Okay? So the next time, what they do is they don't send people in all directions. So each soldier looks at the soldiers neighboring him or her on the front and takes off in a direction perpendicular to a line joining. So the geometry of this front is, it advances uh, perpendicular to itself at a speed given by the local velocity. So that's why it's advancing faster here and it's advancing slower here. So you see that gradually this front is straightening out because this is taking big steps and this is taking small steps. Right? So this is just what I've told you. So uh, surely this reminds you of something you have read about in optics textbooks. Okay, um, this is nothing but the Huygens construction. Huygens construction. But um, I'll take a small diversion. It actually should remind us of two great Dutch scientists, not one. One is Huygens, of course. The other is very much from the middle of the 20th century, uh, and he's quite a hero in computer science. Okay, so his name is Dijkstra. J is pronounced as Y. And uh, the story goes that uh, he was one of the first computer programmers and he wanted to find a nice algorithm which would impress the people who are going to fund the computer. So uh, living in Holland, you have a number of towns and you have a number of roads connecting them. And on each road, you have some time which it takes to go from here to here. All right. So let's take the small digression. Uh, his algorithm is very similar to what we just saw. So he starts from here, distance is zero. And he's supposed to find the shortest path to this point. So first, he sends out two people. Here it's the uh, time taken. So time taken is seven. Yeah. Here the time taken is six. Uh, now from each of these points, again send people in all directions. Okay. So here this is two. So that means six plus two. There is another route which is eight. So don't worry about that, because just keep seven. Likewise, seven plus two is nine which is obviously more than six. But after some time, you will encounter interesting situations like uh, seven plus six is 13, but seven plus two plus three is 12. So you'll write down 12 there. So at every stage of this Dijkstra algorithm, uh, you have a front of uh, vertices. The front keeps advancing and everywhere on the front, you have written down the shortest route to that point. And so as a bonus, when you reach A, you will get the shortest route to A you will also find the shortest route to every other point on the graph. Okay. So you can look this up. So I just thought it very interesting that you could uh, accuse Hygens of plagiarizing Dijkstra algorithm, except that Dijkstra lived some 300 years later. Okay. So uh, this does not refer to the greatness of these two men, both of whom were great. It refers to the fact that the Huygens geometrical construction uh, actually gives you more information then the firm up principle. Okay. So uh, now uh, we 
uh, saw that, but you might also want to give a kind of proof that if you, you construct a rays by taking them locally perpendicular to the wave front, you actually get the shortest path. Huh? So let me try and go to the blackboard, and which is actually white, and see if I can. Uh, so let us say uh, we have some point, and uh, you have some wave front. Okay, uh, and then you have another wave front, and you're going perpendicular. Now the usual case you see because the velocity is constant, is that these are all equal, but now I don't want them to be equal huh? because the velocity is different in different places. Huh? And then you have another wave front and, and so on, right? Maybe I should draw one more in between these. Draw this perpendicular, this perpendicular. Hmm? And draw one more here. Hmm? It's a very crude picture, but it will make the point. Right? So suppose you're looking from here to here. Hmm? Now let's look at an alternative path. Up to here is fine, same distance, okay? And now, uh, ultimately this path has to come back here, right? So now you can see that this being the shortest distance between these two wave fronts, right? Or shortest time between these two wave fronts, sorry, not distance, shortest time. This will either be equal to this or longer than this. If it happens to go along the ray, it will be equal to this. So the only case where you would get back here is there are two rays connecting. And we will actually come to that case. It's a very interesting phenomenon. But right now, assume there's only one ray through each point. Okay? The rays have not focused. So under those conditions, you will find that this path is always going to be greater than this path by the Huygens construction. Okay? So you can think of it as a nice way of implementing uh, Fermat's principle. Okay? So uh, even if the waves get... Uh, reflected, refracted, everything like that, uh, they will always be perpendicular to a wave front, right? That's what Huygens construction proves. But there were people who didn't believe in Huygens construction, who used the normal law of refraction and refraction. And then to prove that this family of uh, rays will always be perpendicular to wave front is quite a difficult mathematical exercise, okay? Went on for more than 100 years, okay? So this shows the power of thinking of rays as an uh, entire family of rays, not just one, perpendicular to a wave front. Now you may say, what is so great about that? So, uh, interestingly, if you just take families of rays, not all families of rays are perpendicular to wave fronts. Okay? So let me illustrate this. So here's a bunch of rays. Okay? Uh, and they're curved rays because they're moving in a non-uniform medium. Okay? Uh, so can we construct a wave front which is perpendicular to all of them? We can. Quite easy. Start from here, go perpendicular. Start from here, go perpendicular, go perpendicular. Right? You can do that. And uh, actually in calculus, there is a well-known concept. Uh, if you have a family of curves, you can construct another family of curves which is orthogonal to the first family. However, this works on the plane in X and Y. But we are really interested, ultimately, in waves which propagate in three dimensions. Okay? And it turned out that the case of three dimensions is quite different from the case of two dimensions. Okay. So here is uh, something that many of you would have sat on. Okay? Uh, but think of it as a set of rays. Okay? Uh, this, ignore this circle. That just happens to be some line which is cutting all these rays. Okay? And uh, they reach the top, which is where you sit. Okay? Now, uh, if you want to uh, give a proper name to the surface, yeah, I have the equation to the surface over there. It's called a hyperboloid of one sheet. So you can basically see if you take z equal to zero, it's a circle of radius A. If you take z either positive or negative, it's a bigger circle. Yeah. So that's the idea. But now what you find is that if I start from here and go perpendicular and continue going perpendicular and come all the way back, I will end up at a different point. So the attempt to construct a wave front perpendicular to all the rays actually fails. So what this really tells you is, what Huygens construction tells you, is that the rays coming from a source and undergoing uh, reflection, refraction, or undergoing anything where they obey Fermat principle cannot be of this kind. In other words, they cannot kind of rotate around each other. Huh? So, uh, so therefore, the statement 
that raise a perpendicular to wave front is more powerful statement than you would think in three dimensions. So now we'll get back to our uh, mirage, right? The uh, atmosphere. And uh, we're going to, uh, first of all, do it in the most straightforward way using Snell's law. Okay. So for that, we will not have a continuous variation of refractive index. We'll say there's one layer with one refractive index of some thickness, another layer with a, in this case, actually I've drawn the other case where the refractive index is increasing. And this is the y direction and the layers are parallel to the x direction, right? So at each interface, you obey Snell's law and see. So of course, uh, the ray looks like a series of straight lines, which are bent with respect to each other. But in the limit that uh, we make these layers smaller and smaller, it will become a curve. So what can we say about this curve? So this is Snell's law. Uh, so I'm calling all I1. I'm not calling this R because that's also the angle of incidence on the next layer. So I'm calling it I2. And uh, sine I1 by sine I2 uh, is N2 by N1. So that's equation has been rewritten as N1 sine I1 equals N2 sine I2. So in the limit, when the layers have gone away and we have a continuous variation of refractive index, we will have a curve which will obey the equation n sine i equal to constant. So what can we say about this curve? Well, if you have something constant, uh, the only thing I know how to do is to differentiate it and put it equal to zero. So remember, n is a function of y. It's not a function of x. So we are assuming that we have a parallel beam coming, not a function of x. The refractive index is constant along these layers. Okay. And likewise, uh, i is also a function of y. So we differentiate with respect to y, and this is what you get. So n cos i into di dy, and then sin i into dn dy. Okay. So does this help? Uh, I'm going to rewrite this equation. And uh, please be patient. You may wonder why I'm rewriting it, but it will give a nice physical result. So one is, of course, move this term to another side. So you'll get a negative sign. Then move this n down, all right? Uh, so it becomes dn over n, which is the same as uh, the derivative of log n, right? So we're going to have the derivative of log n on this side. Then the other thing we're going to do to both these terms is take this cos i, which is the numerator, and push it to the denominator. Of course, you should push it to the denominator of the denominator, right? So that it really belongs to the numerator. Same thing here. So that's how you get this equation. So this is the derivative of log n, but now not with respect to y, with respect to y over sin i. And but let's just think of the change in log n when y over sin i changes by some amount. And the change in this angle of incidence when y over cos i changes by some amount. It's still a bit mysterious. So let's have a figure now. Yeah. So this is the layer x-axis. Uh, this is, let's say, the next layer. This is dy. And this is the direction of the ray. Okay. So what is dy over cos i? This is dy. And uh, this is i. So the ratio of this to this is cos i. Right? So dy divided by cos i is nothing but distance along the ray. Remember, dy is the distance perpendicular to the layers. So dy over cos i is distance along the ray. So this quantity, apart from the minus sign, is the rate of change of the direction, angle i, with respect to distance along the ray. All right. Now what about this? This is logarithm of refractive index, natural logarithm. And what is dy divided by sin i? That is distance perpendicular to the ray, according to the figure. Right. So therefore, uh, oh, okay, I should have that. Distance perpendicular to the ray. So now what we have learned from this is, this quantity is nothing but what you call curvature. How much, by what angle does a curve turn if you travel a unit distance along the curve? And that's the reciprocal of the radius of curvature. Okay? And this is uh, the gradient of the refractive index, right? the rate of change of refractive index, but not moving along the ray, moving perpendicular to the ray. And if you remember in the mirage, that's exactly what happened, right? You had a curvature of the ray 
uh, because the refractive index was very perpendicular to the plane. Okay. So uh, this whole discussion can be summarized in English as saying the curvature of the ray is the transverse gradient. That means look at how the natural logarithm of the refractive index changes as you move perpendicular to the ray. So any change of the refractive index along the ray is not going to bend the ray. Okay, it may slow it down or speed it up, but it's not going to bend the ray. Now, this is uh, such a nice result. It's still not very intuitive. You know, we got it by lots of differentiation of Snell's law and all that. And uh, this is where you can see the power of uh, wave fronts, power of Huygens construction. Uh, you can actually get it from Huygens construction. Huh? So here is a wave front now. And now the y direction has been, yeah, this is uh, the y direction. And let us say uh, you have a ray uh, traveling like this. Okay. So uh, this is, we wait for a time delta t. So if v is the speed at which the wave front advances perpendicular to itself, here it's delta x is just v into delta t. Right? But remember, this velocity depends on refractive index and that's going to have a different value as I go to a different value of y. So therefore, the same delta t has to be now multiplied by v plus uh, partial derivative of v with respect to y okay, into delta y. So now you can see, uh, because of this extra term, your v delta t, which is the same as the separation here, and then you have this extra piece, which is this distance. So therefore, the wave front has tilted over. So if the wave front is tilted over, it means the ray has also tilted over. Right? So if we can find the angle between these two wave fronts, we would have found and then divided by delta y, we will get the curvature of the wave front. Okay? And the angle is quite easy. For small angles, you just take this extra distance and divide by delta y. So that's what we're going to do. So the tilt, uh, and this in this case, the tilt actually happens to be negative. Right? If v increases with y, if this term is positive, the ray actually bends downwards. So, so delta theta is partial derivative into, into delta t, of course. Um, and that we want to divide by uh, so uh, the reciprocal of radius of curvature, which is d theta by dx now. Right? dx is the distance traveled here, is v delta t. So all we pick up is an extra 1 over v. So 1 over v and dv by d1. And we do the same thing we did before. We absorb this V here and call this log V. Okay. So we've not, you may think we've not got quite the same result. The curvature now is the transverse gradient of the logarithm of the velocity. Whereas earlier we had the logarithm of the refractive index. However, that's a nice property of logarithm. So v is C divided by N. So if you take logs, log V is some constant minus log N. So, uh, so therefore, we get the same result as we got before. The curvature of the ray is, and I think this is much more intuitive. You have a wave front, and the speed is different at different points, and therefore the wave front tilts over, and the ray changes. Okay. So I've given you two proofs of this result. If there are people who are still not convinced, uh, I'm going to give you a third proof. Okay. So this is what I call the Brahmastra of optics. You go to the book, uh, Born and Wolf, and on page 124, if you have the patience, you will see this formula. Okay, It says the ray bends toward the region. I mean, this is just for fun. But actually, uh, I don't want to frighten you with this book. You only have to read chapter 3. And if you have the patience and you have the mathematics, you will definitely learn a lot. Uh, just from the geometrical optics chapter. I'm not following that book. Yes. So, just to summarize what's happening in the mirage, the ray curves. Right? And this would remind you a little bit of uh, mechanics. Okay? That uh, you have, a, if you have a particle moving around and you put a force transverse to the particle, as in circular motion, and force is nothing but gradient of the potential, right? then the particle gets deflected from a straight path. So uh, when we go deeper into the analogy between optics and mechanics, which will probably be in the next lecture, 
we will actually see uh, quantitatively that uh, refractive index is replaced by protection. Now, there's a somewhat subtle point here. Okay. Um, we made the layers and then we went to a limit in which the thickness of the layers went to zero. But suppose we don't do that. In the layer model, it is still true. Uh, maybe we'll go back to the uh, layer model or go to whiteboard. In the layer model, uh, the ray comes and I keeps increasing. At some point, uh, it will become greater than the critical angle and we'll go back. If you keep the layer size finite. Okay? However, uh, in the layer model, there's also a horizontal ray. You, if you have a ray which just sticks to one layer, within which the refractive index is uniform, then it will continue horizontally. And this has caused a certain amount of confusion. And uh, I have to say that even the great C. V. Raman uh, wrote a paper with his student Pancharatnam, who is a very brilliant optics person. But this paper actually uh, takes the horizontal ray uh, seriously. And of course, it's correct in the layer model. But if you have a continuous variation of refractive index, then it's not correct. So what this really tells you is you have to be a little careful in taking limits. Of course, later on in that paper, they go and do the wave theory of the mirage. And that paper is absolutely fine. And there's a beautiful experiment also in that. Maybe I'll put it on the Moodle to read it. Uh, but uh, the portion on the horizontal ray, you, uh, you should be careful. Uh, it is certainly true for a model with discrete layers of constant refractive index, right? but it's not true for uh, a continuously variation, varying refractive. Okay, so now uh, more of the optics mechanics and analogy and also a little bit of history. Okay, so the history is uh, that uh, sometime in the late uh, 17th century, um, many eminent mathematicians in Europe and in England got interested in a problem called the curve of quickest descent. And one of the solutions given to this problem was by using an analogy with optics. So I thought I'd explain that also because one of the problems in the problem set which you're going to see today uh, actually has that. So you have some person who's sitting at a point A, right? and there's uh, this horizontal line, uh, x-axis as before. And for some reason, the person decides that uh, he'd like to go to the point B, which lies below the point A. When I say below, I mean gravity is acting along the y-axis. Huh? So uh, one simple thing is to build an inclined plane, and then you can travel, slide down the inclined plane and reach B. Okay, But the question these people asked, and it's a very sensible question, is this is the best way to do it. Can you reach in a shorter time if you take some other path? And you can see that uh, it may be possible because uh, if you have fallen by a certain height, you have lost a certain amount of potential energy. Therefore, you have gained a certain amount of kinetic energy. And uh, therefore, your speed is a function of the uh, depth to which you have fallen. Uh, we'll see that formula in a minute. So maybe it may make more sense to quickly fall so that you've picked up a lot of speed. So even though the length, physical length of this path is longer, the time taken could be shorter. But then which curve do you use? In fact, Galileo tried to solve this problem. He assumed it's the arc of a circle, but that is not correct. Okay. Uh, and there's an entire family of mathematicians called, called Bernoulli. So one of them, called uh, Johann Bernoulli, solved this problem. And he did a kind of thing that people did in the 16th, uh, 17th century. He proposed the problem to all the other great mathematicians of Europe. He challenged them. He said, I have a solution, but I'm keeping it in my drawer. After a few months, you guys can come back. And you can tell me your solution, and then we'll compare notes. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I was telling you about the speed of the particle. If you uh, fall by a depth of y, v is root of 2g. So the velocity is a function of the depth below this line. So this is exactly the propagation of light in a median with uh, many layers, right? where 
the velocity varies in this manner, which means the refractive index varies as a C uh, divided by this, right? I mean, need not be C, it can be any number. So refractive index is proportional to one over square root of Y. Now that's a, actually a quite a weird refractive index because at y equal to zero, the refractive index is infinite. And remember, the fundamental principle is n sin i is a constant. Okay, so if n is infinite, i should be zero. So that's why I've shown this curve falling vertically down because i is zero. But once you have come to a finite value of y, uh, n is no longer infinite, so i is allowed to deviate away from 90 degrees. So of course, you could actually solve this on a computer very easily, right? Take a small step downwards, find the new value of refractive index, find a new value of y, draw one more line, and you could keep doing this. But remember, we are now talking of some 1697 or something. So people had uh, uh, extremely powerful computers, but those computers were entirely inside their heads, okay, above the eyebrows, as we say. And I believe the modern term for that computer uh, the old-fashioned term was just brains. The modern term is wetware. Okay. So Bernoulli had quite a bit of wetware, and he sent this out. Okay. And various people proposed solutions. And uh, there was a certain amount of uh, not very friendly rivalry, uh, because Newton thought he had invented calculus. And I think I mentioned this right in the first lecture. And Leibniz thought he had invented calculus. So both of them sent in solutions. And Newton actually uh, apparently solved it in one evening by a very clever uh, geometrical method. Okay. But Bernoulli solved it by saying, uh, find a curve so that uh, uh, the slope, the slope is not sine i. Huh? In fact, uh, i is the angle made with the normal. So the angle made with the x-axis is 90 minus i and tan of that is cot i. So cot i is the slope. But once you know cot i, you can calculate sin i and put that equal to 1 by root y. So you'll, you'll get some kind of differential equation. So again, uh, you can have the fun doing all this. And this curve happens to be a very interesting curve. Okay? It's called a cycloid in which, uh, and this whole problem has a very learned, impressive name. It's called the brachistochrone, which is Greek for uh, shortest uh, time. So uh, this problem is interesting in its own right. And it's, it's also interesting because this, uh, this cycloid, actually, if you draw it fully, it will go all the way up and come back here. It's the curve described by a point on, if you have a circle with rolls, it comes back here. So actually, you can travel from here to here using gravity. And obviously, if you built an inclined plane, it would never work, right? Because you wouldn't have any velocity. So you have to fall down, pick up velocity, and then come back up. So this brachistochrone problem uh, I mentioned, because uh, it's in the problem sheet. It has a nice, interesting role in history. And of course, it gave a rise to a whole branch of mathematics. Because it's one thing to, for a very brainy person to find a solution to a specific problem. But suppose people have some other integral, not the integral for time. Like if you have a chain hanging, you might want to minimize the position of the center of gravity. Okay. So a whole branch of mathematics was created to take care of this. It's called the calculus of variations. So uh, I'm now going to uh, get you a little bit into the history of uh, optics. So, uh, Huygens is slightly earlier than Newton. Okay? So, we have already seen his construction, but he had a number of other brilliant achievements. He actually uh, found uh, the rings of Saturn. He, he knew that the simple pendulum does not exactly oscillate in a fixed period independently of amplitude, even though we are taught that in PUC. And he found the exact curve. And if you move the bob on that curve, it will oscillate to the period independent of amplitude, right? That's quite a formidable mathematical problem. And of course, he gave us Huygens construction. And uh, we have already seen some consequences of Huygens construction. We'll see many more okay, as we go along. 
So it's a very powerful tool of geometric logic. Now you notice that uh, I use the word front, even though in the text I had the word wavefront. Now it's absolutely true that Huygens' inspiration for his construction came from waves. Uh, in fact, his book is available. It's called The Treatise on Light in translation. Um, and uh, you go through it, you see many interesting things. Right? In particular, he was famous for analyzing a phenomenon which we have touched on that in a crystal, light will not spread out in a spherical way. In fact, he explained uh, double refraction by saying that in this crystal called calcite and other crystals, the, uh, you have two wave fronts, uh, one which is spherical and one which is elliptical. And using his construction, he was able to show how these wave run. Today, we know that the cause of this behavior is something called polarization of light, which we will come to later in the course. The fact that light is a transverse wave and the electric field can point in two different directions perpendicular to the wave. And these two travel with different velocities. Okay. But Huygens had no clue about that. So he gave a purely geometrical solution. Now it's true that he was inspired by waves. But uh, I went through the book. There's no mention of what the wavelength of light could be. Uh, there's no, uh, the concept of phase of a wave or wavelength or interference. It's completely not there. It's implicit because his construction says, find the perpendicular, the shortest path. And in the discussion of the first lecture, the ultimate justification for taking the shortest path comes from wave theory. Now, whether he knew this intuitively, we do not know. So this is Huygens' contribution to optics. Uh, now let's look at his great rival, Newton. Now, Newton actually believed in a particle theory of light. Okay. However, he actually observed Newton's rings, right? That's why they're named after him. Uh, many of you have done that experiment. It's an interference experiment. A thin film uh, shows colors. Even if you spill oil on the road on water, you'll see thin colors. And Newton observed them and he explained them. Okay. He explained them. Uh, he believed in particles, but these were no ordinary particles. So he said these particles move and he realized that sometimes the particles get through, sometimes they don't. Right? Uh, and when you get more reflected light, you get less transmitted light. So he says there's some property which varies periodically along the ray. He didn't say what it was. He called it distance between fits of easy reflection or something. And he gave a number for this length. He realized it's longer for red and shorter for blue. So he did everything except create a wave theory of light. Okay. So he gave actual numbers. They're there in his book on optics. And he even made a very interesting comment on double refraction. Of course, the problem had been solved by Huygens, but he thought a little deeper, why do you have two rays? And he said, maybe it is because these particles have some property which he called sites, which means if you want to interpret it, there is some interesting property perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Okay. He didn't say what it was because, so you can see that he had a lot of insight into the wave theory of light without actually believing in waves. He also observed the diffraction of light. Apart from his famous prism experiment, he conducted experiments on shadows, and except he called it inflection. And he clearly knew it was important because even the cover page of his book says a treatise on reflection, refraction, and inflection of light. So I submit to you that contrary to what you have been taught, uh, the greatest figure in geometrical optics in the 17th century was Huygens. And the greatest figure in wave optics uh, was actually Newton. So the history, I'm telling you an alternative history. Of life. Now, uh, you must be worrying that we are spending a lot of time on geometrical optics, but I do hope I've uh, shown, shown you things uh, at least in a different way from what you've learned. Okay. So now, uh, we'll uh, stop the sharing and uh, we'll take some time for uh, questions uh, before we move on.
of course, we will have time for questions later, but if there's something immediately raised by the lecture, why not deal with it in this session? Hi, so uh, if, if your people have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll see them and I'll queue you up to ask questions to Rajana. Yeah. And announce your name. And maybe even if you make yourself visible, that might be nice, but that's not compulsory. Okay. So can you explain this so, once uh, again? This part. Yeah, sure, sure. No. Uh, uh, is this part clear? This is not, first of all, we are going to a continuous variation of refractive index as a limiting process, dividing the medium into layers where the refractive index has a constant value in one layer. Then as Y increases, it has a greater value and a greater value and so on. So N increases with Y. So this is nothing but Snell's law. Sin I1 divided by sin I2 is N2 by N1. So that means the product of N and sin I is the same in the first layer and the second layer. And then if you apply Snell's law at the boundary between the second layer and the third layer, you will again get that that's equal to N3 sin I3 and so on. So that is for the model with discrete layers. So the ray will go like this, then like this, then like this. Then of course it will reach the critical angle and it will bounce back. But now uh, we want to go to the continuous case. So we say n sin i is a constant. And now n and i are continuous functions of y. So we can differentiate them and so on. So up to this is okay. So after that, it's just calculus, but let me go over it again. This is what happens when you differentiate. Uh, let me see if I can go to the... Uh, So this differential equation, so this is the rate of change of i with respect to y and the rate of change of n with respect to y. But because of this factor sin i and cos i, we can interpret this as the rate of change of, I can bring this down. Yeah. So this is now the rate of change of i, not the change in i is not being divided by the change in y. It's being divided by the change in y cos i. And the change in y cos i, so the ray is coming like that. This is the angle of incidence. So dy is the thickness of the layer. dy divided by cos i is the distance traveled by the ray within the layer. Okay. I mean, still thinking in terms of layers, right? So uh, maybe this is the step that. Now, this is the definition of curvature. So I, I don't know whether you people have, if you calculate the curvature of curves in a calculus course, it's defined as d theta by ds where theta is, uh, tan theta is dy by dx, right? Uh, you must have come across that. But more intuitively, if I travel a unit distance along the curve and the tangent to the curve turns by an angle di, and this is distance traveled, that ratio is the curvature. And then the other equation, other side, if you look at this side, now the denominator is dy divided by sin i. So let me get that denominator up. So we are looking at the change in n when you travel a unit distance dy by sin i, which is the distance perpendicular to the ray. So this is the ray, this is the normal to the layer, and this is distance perpendicular. So that's how I arrived at. So let me, in fact, go back to the original garage uh, picture. So here, just the shading tells you, let's look at the ray here at this point. So you can ask, why is it curving like this? And the answer is that perpendicular ray, you have a gradient of logarithm of the refractive index. Yeah? So this is the qualitative picture and the quantitative picture is what you saw. But now, uh, if you, I think this is the more intuitive so you don't worry about the calculation. That's if you read it once, you'll understand it. But the basic idea is that a plane wave front, which moves by v delta t uh, at this point, but here it moves by more because v has changed. So if v or the refractive index changes along the wave front, which means perpendicular to the ray, 
then the wavefront tilts over. Okay. So, so that's the idea. So is that does that help? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, and any Thank more? You, sir. Huh. Any more hands? So, okay. Technically speaking, uh, I gave you a, a kind of uh, intuitive proof that you cannot draw a surface which is perpendicular to all these rays. Hmm? Uh, the formal proof would depend on uh, some more advanced calculus which I have not uh, written here. Okay, but I can state it anyway. Huh? Uh, basically, here, uh, how did we construct the surface? Uh, these are the rays. Uh, and this is an orthogonal family of curves. So in, in the, in, when you are in two dimensions, the rays are curves and the wavefronts are also curves. And there is a, if you know the derivative here, you also know the derivative of this. So you can set up a differential equation and you can solve it. Hmm? Now here, uh, the geometric construction was move perpendicular. Let's say we want to construct the wavefront. So I start from here, move perpendicular, move perpendicular. You can see I'm, I keep going down. And that is true even when I go in the back of this. So when you come back to the same ray, the surface cuts it at a different point. So that's the intuitive argument. And the mathematical argument is that, uh, okay, so let me state it. Here, the unit vector along the ray is the gradient of uh, a function which is constant on the wavefront. Yeah? So if you had a wavefront here, these vectors would be uh, the gradient of that. But as you know, the curl of gradient is zero. Whereas if you have a vector which has a curl, then it cannot be the gradient of anything. That's the mathematical argument. Um, but I agree, this goes a little beyond the maths which we are using right now in this course. But I at least I hope it helps. Yes, thank you. Uh, but yes, so maybe question. I'll keep it on, depending okay. on the next question. Yes. Uh, Sachin, you can go ahead with, with your question. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Mm. Uh, yes, I had the same question about uh, the yellow figure. Because like, if we start with a cylindrical uh, shape, and uh, we could get a spherical wavefront on the sides, right? Not a For spherical. A... If it is cylindrical, it will actually be a plane wavefront, right? If this was a cylinder, you could draw a plane perpendicular to the cylinder, and that would be like a wavefront. But yeah, I, I mean, if all these lines were vertical, uh, yes, yeah, 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 ah, sir. Uh, yeah. If all these lines were vertical, and I was tracing the outline of the uh, wavefront on these mm. lines, then mm. uh, that would give a spherical shape, right? It'll a circle. Well, if I uh, just go around, it'll be a circle. But yeah, yeah, uh, I, I so, agree with you. <laughs> so if I twist the cylinder uh, a bit, I get this pa hyperbolic parabola, right? So when I twist it uh, such that z square plus a square is zero then there's no wavefront in that, at that point. Uh, what, what, that, what does this mean? Like all the rays are intersecting at that point and uh, okay, okay. after that they are diverging again. Okay, okay. So let me explain. So what this really means is if you have a set of straight lines like this, you cannot get such straight lines by taking a point source and putting it through any number of mirrors or lenses or anything like that. Okay. So it's in a sense, it's a impossibility proof that, and the more technical way of stating it is a family of rays cannot have a rotation. I mean, you called it twist and uh, in explaining to Deepto, I called it curl. Hmm? So because rays are perpendicular to wavefronts, uh, they cannot have this property of twist. Um, if someone wants to go deeper into it, then I can, I can do that, but yes. And the intuitive way of seeing it is if you try to construct a wavefront, you encounter this problem that you go around and when you come back, you, you don't end up at the, at the same point. You end up somewhere else. Whereas the cylinder, you ended up at the same point. Okay, uh, the next one. You ah. had your hand raised. Do you want yeah, to I did, but uh, sir had actually answered my question. Okay. Um, okay. Like while he was explaining one of the first ones, I, I got answered. So. Okay. So how are we doing then? 
we are fine there are a few questions on youtube if you want to answer them yes uh, yes definitely yeah. why not but i i cannot I... I cannot figure out what he's asking uh, he's saying in the model with oh in the model with continuous variation of layer why does the yeah. horizontal ray solution disappear ah that's a really interesting question <laughs> yeah. mm. okay uh, yeah i'll stop the share or i'll start a new share and go to I, i'll have to go to the whiteboard if the angles theta are very small these curves are parabolas okay so uh, this is a parabola but that is because the ray started from here but you could also have a ray which started from here that will be another parabola and so on so just imagine that you have this family of parabola now we can ask as i said i'm going to give a somewhat mathematical answer to the question we can ask what kind of differential equation this obey okay so uh, this family of parabolas is given by y is equal to some constant into x minus a the whole square okay where a happens to be the location of the vertex of the parabola hmm? so if you take uh, uh, dy by dx okay uh, so that would be 2k into x minus a which would be 2k into the square root of what hmm? so let's uh, imagine that uh, say i have chosen this in such a way that the lowest point lies at y equal to 0 hmm? now normally there is a uniqueness theorem for differential equations okay if you go to any point you give me a value of dy by dx i should be able to move from there and i can form so this is a case where the uniqueness theorem actually breaks down because actually y equal to 0 is a solution of this equation right dy by dx is 0 and root y is 0 so geometrically what is happening is this family of parabolas has an envelope and on the envelope the slope of the parabola is the same as the slope of the envelope okay so strictly speaking uh, you're dealing with a differential equation where this uniqueness breaks down hmm? so i don't know whether the person who asked the question wanted a very mathematical answer so i would say this is a very singular limit now if you wanted a more physics question right uh, we have to appeal to the wave theory of light that is you cannot have no matter how small the wavelength is you cannot have a ray of zero thickness if you have a ray of very small thickness it will spread out and once it spreads out the wave front starts sampling regions of different refractive index and it starts tilting over that's the physics answer this is the math answer so math answer is uniqueness theorem breaks down uh, so i don't know if the person uh, <laughs> wanted the math answer that is it okay okay so there are there are a few questions uh, that people are asked like few people who want to ask questions one is in the chat box uh, someone yeah. wants you to go again over the slide number 7 mm. uh, if, if i you can do that remember what it is <laughs> i should number my slides from now on so uh, here we are maybe uh, that person can go ahead and ask yeah which which is uh, oh okay this is 7 oh 7 is this computer science Huh? Well, this is a little removed. I just thought it's a nice, but the algorithm. Shall I shall I go over it again? Anyway, we are past the precise time. But if people want to stay on, I am happy to stay on. Hmm? After all, that happens in a live lecture, right? I mean, we go out to have tea and then we talk. Okay, so the statement of the problem is very clear. You are given a graph, as the computer science people call it. You are given edges on the graph. Each edge is given a weight, which is positive, which corresponds to the time taken to go from here to here. So you have to find a path on, and remember there are so many paths going from G to A, right? You can, you can, you have to locate the path in which the sum of the weights of all the edges traversed is the minimum. So that's 
So the algorithm goes like this. You first write zero here. Then take all possible paths which come out from this vertex. So uh, we can call that the first generation of vertices. So in the first generation of vertices, you write down the time taken. So that's why you write down seven here. Then each one of these spawns a second generation of vertices. Right? So if you ask what is the second generation of uh, B, I think this was B, uh, F. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, F. Then uh, this point, this point, and this point all belong to the second generation. So notice that uh, you can have point like E belonging both to the first generation and to the second generation. And that happens because we have different paths possibly reaching E. So now what you do is certain points you will be visiting for the first time. Like if I have uh, 6 here, I write down 11 here. That's the only route I have to this point so far. Okay. But here I have 7 and I have uh, 6 plus 2. So whenever you have two numbers written down on a vertex, pick the lower one, throw out the other one. So the corresponding step in Huggins construction is throw away all the people who are not on that front. So take only the envelope of that front. Then you repeat. So from here again, you go in all directions, including back here. But what you don't do is you don't go back here. Because any point where you have exhausted all the vertices, you don't need to go back there. But any point where you have not exhausted all the vertices, all the uh, edges which come to that point, you keep moving. So gradually you will cover the whole graph. It also turns out this is the most efficient way of doing it. Because at every stage you are throwing away uh, paths which are not useful. And I, I just thought that it's, uh, I learned this algorithm quite late in my life. But uh, since I already knew Huygens construction, it reminded me very much of that. Okay. So that takes care of, uh, I hope, that question. Uh, slide seven. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, do people want to stay? We are past the time and there are a few questions coming in still. Uh, uh, there's Siddharth who wants to ask a, a question. So uh, maybe we'll take his question and then we'll break and then we'll uh, come back at questions in the like when we start the tutorial. So when we restart, we will restart with the uh, full full group present. Is that the idea? Only then does it make sense to answer questions. No. Uh, maybe Aditya, we could take another five minutes to finish off the question. Okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. We, we have a yeah, yeah, I'm happy to finish. start. Yeah, you go ahead. Good morning, sir. Uh, mm. I wanted to ask that in the high sense construction, we take uh, the backwards wave to be absent, but uh, uh, why is that so? Because uh, we assume that each point acts as a source for secondary wave prints, so wave should propagate in every direction. What's the reason that we neglect the backwards wave? Is there a mathematical proof for that? Okay, there is a mathematical proof, but remember that that is why I gave you this completely different way of looking at Huygens construction, which is not the way that he thought about it, which is because we started from Fermat's principle. Um, uh, you think of it as implementing this algorithm, which we already have as a way of finding the shortest path. Okay. So yes. in that way of looking at it, the backward is not needed no? because that would correspond to going from here and going back to one of these vertices, right? Which you would not do because you've already found the shortest path to this one. So, uh, so that is a kind of legalistic answer I'm giving you that uh, this part of the course only deals with geometrical optics. Uh, uh, so, terrible. but if, if you read if you read textbooks on wave optics, you will find a more mathematical formulation of Huygens principle, uh, which is called Kirchhoff's integral or something, which actually uh, uh, the the backward way vanishes. But even the Kirchhoff theory is not very correct. Unfortunately, in this course, we may not be able to reach uh, up to that level, the diffraction and so on. But if you want to read, I would suggest that you've heard the Kirchhoff's laws in electrical circuits, right? Same Kirchhoff yes, sir. gave a more mathematical formulation of Huygens principle. And you can look it up in, you don't have to go to Born and Wolf. I think you'll find it in books on electrodynamics or other places. So that's the best answer I can give you in the framework of this course. But as I said, right now, there are no waves. There's no phase, no interference. We're just dealing geometrical optics. 
and uh, Huygens construct. That's why I'm distinguishing between Huygens construction and Huygens principle. Construction is a nice way of forming rays and wave fronts. The principle actually deals with diffraction. So. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one in the chat box. It yeah. is, sir. Can you explain how to find theta for mirage? The deviation occurred. Uh, so I think this mm. is really okay. I'll give a simple answer. Uh, that's there in problem two. In problem two, we apply this principle of n sin i equal to constant. Okay, so that principle is Snell's law, and that can actually be obtained to get the shape, parabolic shape of the mirror, which I assume. Yeah? So uh, please be patient until you solve problem in the problem session. Uh, there is one question from YouTube that mm -hmm. is in the medium with layers. What is the intuition for natural law being there? Ah. I would rather say a fractional change in refractive index. Hmm? Uh, yeah, so if you, okay, so let me give my intuition for that. See, what really matters here is not the actual velocity. Hmm? What matters is the ratio of this velocity and this velocity. Okay? So suppose I take all velocities and reduce them. This wavefront will advance more slowly. But when it advances this much of distance, it will take more time, but it will tilt by the same amount. So what really matters is ratios of velocities. And uh, the most natural, so the change in ratio is nothing but uh, the change. I mean, it's related to the change in the logarithm. And so the very fact that you get delta V divided by V tells you it's the fractional change in velocity going from here to here. So if the velocity changes by you know one percent in going from here to here, never mind what the velocity is, you will get this much of it. So that's the intuition for the logarithm. Pranav, you you ask your question. Yeah. Sir, uh, I mean I would like to I would like you to revisit the uh, you know uh, the one where we talked about uh, uh, the one where we talked about the lateral uh, lateral wave. So can uh, you yeah. <laughs> So, uh, can you you know give us uh, an intuition how the total uh, internal reflection path is a stationary path? Because whatever way I see, like a, a small variation in that uh, total internal reflection path and the lateral wave path uh, is actually you know bigger. I mean, uh, takes more time in one direction and uh, takes small uh, lesser time in the other direction. So I don't see the stationarity of that uh, those two paths. So can you go? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, we can do that. Uh, that's uh, actually, uh, I think a figure from the first lecture would have helped, but let me try and do that. So this is a path coming in at the critical angle. Huh? So what happens is if I displace this point by some epsilon, then we get epsilon, uh, this path becomes longer by epsilon cos of this angle. And this path becomes shorter by epsilon because there's no angle here. No? So if this first order term in epsilon has to vanish, right? Oh, sorry, this becomes uh, shorter geometrically by epsilon, uh, let me see, epsilon sine c actually. Cos of this angle is sine c. Because critical angle is measured with respect to normal. Huh? So epsilon sine c divided by the velocity in water should cancel epsilon divided by the velocity in uh, land. So that's what tells you that this for stationarity, this angle has to be the critical angle. Same, same is true here. So you can actually check that this uh, path, and also common sense will tell you that, look, if you are here and the person is drowning here, you better get to land immediately and run on land and get back. Okay? But this subtle point is that you should not run perpendicularly to the land. You should run at the critical angle. Yeah. So... Uh, her question is, mm. is uh, uh, if the refractive index takes the place of a potential, do we get an exact analog between geometric optics and mechanics? Um, okay, uh, that's a nice question, which I would be addressing in the next lecture. Uh, the precise analogy comes only in a limiting case, uh, which is called paraxial optics, where all the angles are small. Then I can 
I will be exhibiting for you an equation which looks exactly the same in mechanics. Uh, and uh, the refractive index actually plays the role of minus the potential, but otherwise it's the same thing. Huh? But when you deal with large angles, the analogy is not perfect. But each, each principle, we have a different principle in mechanics, then, which is not identical to Fermat's principle. So all this is uh, in store for us in the next uh, maybe two lectures. I think that is it for now. Uh, I don't see any okay. raised hand or okay, anything then. in the chat box. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone.